All right, today we're doing slicking and slurry system. So we start with the lime silo. Just a side edge. It's really longer, but we're going to need that room later. At the bottom of the lime silo, what's the first component? Knife gate. Knife gate. Then where do we go to? Which feeder? Screw feeder. Screw feeder. Screw feeder we go on to? Rotary feeder. Rotary feeder we go on to what? Makes sense. What? Chuck. The Slicking chamber. Slicking chamber. Somebody said mixing chamber and got me doubting myself. <laughs> All right. Why two feeders? One of the screw feeder is to, the screw feeder is for like speed or how much you want to. That is correct. We have a variable drive, which controls how fast this motor goes, and that controls how fast you're putting the lime into the system. What's the rotary figure for? Keep moisture from backing up. Say it again. Keep moisture from backing up. Keep moisture from backing up. So, rotary figure has a whole bunch of little wedges, and the lime gets dumped into the wedge, and the wedge swings around and dumps it to the slaker, and the whole point is to keep the vapors from going back up in here because the lime, when it gets wet, will clump together. What's the other thing we use to keep it from clumping together? Vapor extractor. Vapor extractor. All right. So we put lime into the slicking chamber, and we got to mix water with it. So there's a flow control valve. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff on this header too, isn't there? So there's a block valve, and then there's a strainer. There's a pressure reducer valve. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that this goes to, but none of it has near as much flow as that slicking water valve. So this has solenoids that are going like across the weir and I don't know what else. Oh, down on the grid screen too, huh? Yeah. All right. What tells this valve how much water to put in there? Temperature. Of? Slicker. Of slurry. Slur. All right. So the temperature in the chamber and what are we trying to maintain? Uh, 90 degrees. No, it's like no. 170. 100, yeah, 150. 170. This number does get moved around some. So by controlling this temperature, okay, so you're going to put water in there, and then you're going to put lime in there, and you're going to have an exothermic reaction. Exothermic is a big fancy word meaning that it heats up. So when it heats up, it's going to try and start boiling, and you put more water in there, Make sure you have enough water to cool it down and keep it at 170. Traditionally, the temperature's in red, don't The temperature of the water isn't going in, it's like night. That is correct. But what about in winter? Try to get as close as possible. 
<laughs> we heat okay. water with the spark. That's it. You, you knew this, but you were not giving me the, you didn't buy my hint. No. All right, so where's this water coming from? Service water. All right, from the service water deck. So the sparger takes off steam and adds it to the water to get you 90 degrees on the inlet. And in the summer, if this sparger is not working, you'll be 85 degrees and everything will be okay. And in the winter, if you don't have this sparger and you're putting in 40 degree water, then it doesn't take much water to cool it down to 170, and the slurry gets really thick and dense. And so then you have to lower this set point to keep the slurry from being too dense, which will then cause problems in your valves and your pumps and wherever the hell else. Another reason we like this water to be warm is because this chemical reaction is kind of like dissolving, right? So the hotter the <coughs> The, the sweet tea scenario, right? If you mix your sugar into your sweet tea right when you make the pitcher, and the pitcher is still nice and hot for making the sweet tea, then it dissolves. If you take the same sugar and put the same ratio of sugar and put it in your cup of iced tea, that sugar all settles to the damn bottom. And you can sit there and stir it for freaking 10 minutes before you get it all dissolved. So we want the reaction to happen fast, so we want warmer water on the end. All right, so that goes into the slaking chamber, and then that overflows into the mixing chamber, and then that overflows to what? Storage tank. Rich Rich Green. Oh, Rich Green. So most of it goes straight through the grid screen and into the storage tank. And then the grid screen has a shaker. And then all the stuff ends up going around on the outside legs and making laps. And there's a little chute. And then there's another screw. And then that goes to the dumpster. And then you dump that dumpster what, once every three or four days, five days a week. I'm getting side eye. So less than a week <laughs> because it gets swapped when we it gets dumped when we swap slakers. Now there have been times that we bought our lime from a different company and got a different grade of lime and saved the company money and then had to dump this damn thing three times a shift. And also and all that grit was causing wear on the equipment. And so even though it was saving money, it didn't end up saving money in the long run because the grit built up in the bottom and it would get in the way of the mixers and it would eat the paddles up and then we had to have the whole bottom recoated and we had the paddles replaced. And so it was a big pain in the ass. All right. How do we maintain the level in the slurry tank. Batch mode. Okay, batch mode is not a wrong answer. Describe batch mode. Uh, it looks at set points and how much of, well, say you got like, you want to keep it at like 75%, so it'll see that set point and it'll make slurry until you hit that set point and then it'll go, I mean, it'll stop. Until so you hit a different set point and you start back up. All right, so batch mode has a band, which is going to be something like 60 at the low end and 75 at the high end. These are set points the control room operator can type in whatever the hell they want. And when it gets down to 60, 
then everything starts up. Well, the mixers are always going, the bridge screen's always going. But the gate comes open, the rotor, the rotor repeater starts, the screw repeater starts, the water starts, maintain the temperature, and then that, and then when it fills, starts, level starts going up, it gets to 75, and everything shuts down. That's batch mode. What's the other mode called? Continuous. Continuous. And so on continuous, there's a set point, 75%, and when the level starts to go down, the screw speeder speeds up, and when the level starts to come up, the screw speeder slows down, and then when the screw speeder speeds up and down, the water goes off, does the same thing, goes the same direction, because we're trying to maintain that temperature, and everything works itself out that way. It turns out that for reasons I don't understand, the logic that lets it control this level is not easy to tune. So you end up with this thing going, so you, the screw feeder, it's got a, a minimum speed of like 10% and a maximum speed, maximum speed in auto of like 50%. You can type in higher numbers manually. For, in batch mode, you can type in higher numbers. So what ends up happening is this thing ends up swinging from 10% to 50% over the course of like 10 hours. It's this really long, slow chase, and I don't know why it's so hard to tune out in auto, but it's, we, hadn't, we ain't managed to do it. All right, uh, other levels of note. If you get down to 40%, what happens? Mixer uh, uh, starts to vibrate. At 40%, the mixer shuts off because somewhere around 35%, it starts to vibrate. Uh, and then if you get down to 10%, then you lose your slurry pump. And you can't start that slurry back pump back up until you get up to like 30%. So if you lose it, you're going to be done for a while. <laughs> out of the slurry tank and we're going to the slurry pump. There is outside of the pump house, right next to the tank, there is an air operated valve on the suction. Why do we have to have that? Guesses? Go on back flow when you get started building up stuff. You want to manually open it up. All right. So you got two pumps that are going to one header. All right. Each pump is designated to a certain tank. Yeah, that is a true statement. Each pump takes suction off a different tank. That is not where I was going with this, though. Uh, where I'm going is that because of the nature of slurry, you can't have check valves in the system. So that means that the slurry is going to want to go backwards through that other pump, and that block valve on the suction is what keeps that from happening. But like Jackie said, in real life, we throttle the discharges in manual, kind of keep that from happening on our own. What else? Got seal water out there. a little solenoid valve, and that puts surface water on the pump. So if you look at the shaft of the pump, you'll see water getting slung out. If you didn't have this, you'd see slurry getting slung out. So I believe the flow on that, on that side glass is on your rounds. If you're starting the system, then you're going to want to eyeball that and make sure that flow starts. You're not going to want to wait 12 hours until the next guy does his rounds to find out you don't fucking have any. Yeah. Solenoid valves do fail. This is something that's been replaced a couple of times. All right. And 
this goes on up to the penthouse. And we've got a duplex strainer up there. The strainer is catching all, catching whatever grit that the grit screen doesn't. Or more realistically, it's catching the grit if there's a hole in the grit screen. Before it was a weekly PM to swap slakers and change out the grit screen, we got holes all the time. There's been other modifications too. Remember I said that the grit kind of goes around the edge? There used to be this scoop that would stick out to catch little grit balls and guide them to the chute. And right where that freaking scoop was, the it would shake and tear up the screen. And you, you get a tear there all the time. There used to be a hood over the whole thing to make it safer so there'd be less splashing. But what that meant that was that changing out the grit screen involved this giant freaking hood that only had a couple of viewport holes in it and you had to manhandle the thing up with ropes and I mean still it's still not super easy, but it's way easier. It was... Alright. So the sewing pumps go up to the pump house, or up, up to the pit house, go through the strainer. Is it upstream, Jackie? I always get. Yep, it's upstream. All right. Yes. Terry, what's that valve do? That's a, a research valve. That's a true statement, though it's not the wording I was looking for. All right. So it is taking the slurry back down and to the slurry tank. Okay. You got an air operated jobber, and then you got two manual valves, one going to the tank and one going to the grid screen. So, it is recirculating the slurry, but what is telling it how open or shut to be? What's it looking at to decide what it should be doing? Density? No. I mean, uh, uh, how much water we put in the atomizer? I mean, well, stop guessing. <laughs> Anybody know? They pay it on your strainers. Uh, they're still not quite right. Now, think pressure after your strainers. Pressure. So it wants to make sure that you've got, this number changes sometimes, I'm going to go with 28 PSI after the strainers. So this valve is going to pinch off to drive that pressure up to 28. And then this is getting going down the middle and then it splits off and then that splits off three more times, and then we got a flow control valve, and then we're going to an atomizer. So, load drops. Ooh, hold on. What's the purpose of slurry? Get rid of that. SO2. Reduce SO2. All right. Where does SO2 come from? Where does, well, yeah, where does SO2 come from? Coal. Coal. So when you dig stuff out of the ground, you get more than exactly what you want. It's not pure coal that we got, right? So there's sulfur in the coal. And just like when the coal burns and it makes carbon dioxide, then the sulfur burns and it makes sulfur dioxide. And carbon dioxide is relatively harmless. You, you breathe it, plants breathe it, everything's fine. Sulfur dioxide is poisonous. Makes acid rain bad for uh, nature. Uh, eggs, right? The, the bird eggs get fragile and thing. So SO2 is bad, and we gotta get rid of it. So we spray the slurry into the flue gas path, and it bonds the bicarbonate bonds with the sulfur dioxide, and then it becomes a solid and goes out into the landfill with the ash. 
instead of going out in the atmosphere, which is bad. So, where I was going. So we drop load, and then that means you're burning less coal, which means you've got less sulfur, which means you don't need as much slurry, so these valves pinch back, and then that drives up this pressure, and then this valve comes open, and then that brings that pressure back to set point. It's key that it's maintaining the pressure downstream of the strainers, so that if your strainers start to get clogged up, then this valve will pinch back to drive slurry through the strainers to make sure that these valves can stay the same position and do their jobs the way they work. Control valve, and we've got flow transmitter, and then we go to the gate valve, and that goes to the hose, which goes down to the atomizer. What is the purpose of the atomizer? Atomize the slurry. What does atomize mean? Break it into very Tiny. small parts. Very small parts. So, missed. Back in the day, back in the 50s and the 20s and stuff, the perfume misters used to be called atomizers. Because you're making a mist, you're making a very fine particles, and atomizing was like a cool high-tech way of saying it. And now they just call them sprayers. So, this wheel is spinning at 11,000 RPM, it's got 12 little nozzles on it. Is it 12, Jackie? It's 12. 15. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got different models, and I think they've got 12. And then, because it's spinning so fast, then it breaks it into little bitty drops. And then that fine mist, the smaller the drops are, then the more interactions you get, the more chances you have for your, sulfur, your, your bicarbonate, your slurry, to bump into a sulfur atom and bond up. More surface area, more particles. More bonding. All right. Let's change colors. So this is the FGD tank. What's FGD stand for? Correct. <coughs> and it's got two pumps. They go to a common header, and then they have a little resort valve. It goes right back to the tank. And then if you want to get really fancy, you can put the inlet and outlet isolation. You can put a bypass. flow transmitter so that it knows to maintain 400 gallons a minute. We have had to run on this bypass before. Not too long ago. Yeah, not, not all that long ago. So the, the FGD tank, well, the FGD tank had, was, uh, had particles in it had, that was causing stuff to scale up. And the inside of the control valve scaled up and it got stuck and wouldn't do what it was supposed to, so we ran out of the bypass. Which actually worked remarkably well and made me wonder why we even have control valves. Uh, when you're doing the pump swaps, monthly pump swaps, you start one pump and then shut down the other. Most of the time, the control room operator says, hey, take your time, walk it down, make sure you got good pressure, make sure you feel confident everything sounds right before we stop the other pump. When you run both of these pumps at once, the logic says, I need 800 gallons a minute. And that valve wide open will not get you 800 gallons a minute. So 
you get something like 45 seconds before it goes, hey man, this is gonna have a flow, and it trips the pumps to protect them from cavitating and damage themselves because somebody picked the wrong number. So, when you're doing the pump swap on the FGD tank, I made this look like there's two lines there. It really don't look like so when you're doing the pump swap on the FGD tank, don't delete it out. Or else the controller might, operator might shut one off on you because it's going to trip anyway. All right. So then this goes up to the penthouse and it has a pressure control valve, which is set for 30 psi. And then it goes to the middle of the room, and then it goes out to a north and a south header, and then that goes to a one and a two and a three. And then that has a flow control valve and a flow transmitter. And that ties in. It's prettier than that. Upstream of the gate valve. And then those two mix together and go to the atomizer and go out. What is the purpose of dilution water? Control temperature. Control temperature. What kind of temperatures are we looking for? Um, I just had uh, 165. Alright, 165 is on the low end. Uh, 165 to 172 ish, somewhere in that ballpark. It turns red on the screen when it gets below 170. But it runs red on the screen all the time because we've decided that we want it lower and nobody's come through and adjusted all the alarms. So, what happens if you get this temperature too low? Get mud. You get mud. You put more slurry in there. You. The slurry gets cold, the slurry hits the side, you know, it shoots further out before it, it gets carried off in the flue gas, it bonds to the ed edges of your SDA, and then you get mud building up on the sides of the SDA, and then maybe you get a big plug at the bottom, and then maybe you have to spend $15,000 to have contractors come in and blow the mud out the bottom. Why do we want it low at all? Why don't we just not use any dilution water at all. Cost efficiency. efficiency. So, we were talking about how the more surface area you get, the uh, better reduction you get, right? The more SO2 you can get rid of for the same gallon of lime. Gallon of slurry, lime. It's a solid, you don't better anything else. So if you add extra water in here, then that's extra surface area, and so that's more effective reduction. So we're constantly trying to balance out these two things. We're constantly lowering this a half a degree, a degree, oh, now it's money. Now you go about up a, up a degree. Oh, it stayed muddy. Damn, we gotta go up three degrees, let it dry out, let it shed. Now let's start walking it back down. All right. Where does the water for the FGD tank come from? Softening tank. From the softening tank.
Where does the water for the softening tank come from? Or leachate is a very good answer. Ooh, all that on the horizontal. All right, so surface water goes with control valve. And that control valve goes to the softening tank. Or it goes with the FGD tank. All right, if this server water valve is going to two different places, can be lined up to go to two different places, what is it looking at to decide how open it should be? Uh, level on the FGD tank. Level in the FGD tank, even if you're lining up to the softening tank? Yeah. That is correct. If you put it in the softening tank, the softening tank is full all the way and overflows into the FGD tank. So there's no softening tank level to worry about. Except once a month when we drain it to clean it out. So then when you're lining it up and you know it's empty, you got to be cautious or you steal all the water that's supposed to be going to your FGD tank. And then that'll trip your, FG, your dilution water pumps. And then you won't have any water going up here. And then the SO2 starts going up and your temperatures start going up. And then the control room operator is yelling at you. And conceivably, we could end up getting a violation. We could end up violating our air permits. There is a three hour limit that you have to keep this SO2 under. There's a 24 hour limit too, but anything you guys do to trip these pumps will recover that. I mean, I guess if you went out with a sledgehammer and broke both of them, then maybe we wouldn't recover it. But 24 hours gives us a lot to play with to you know run lower and bring the average back down. Three hours is tight. Softening tank. How is it softening anything? We yeah. slur it to control pH 10.5 and 11.5. All right. Quiet place is good. Where did we get the slurry from? Slurry uh, tank. All right. So, over here, this is silo B and this is tank B. And all that has another side, that, that has an A side as well. And then there is a couple of valves that let them cross connect and equalize. And then there is a line coming off between them. It goes to that little hose pump. And that hose pump goes into the softening tank. And it's going to raise the pH. And what are the set points split? 10, 5 to 11, 5. They're right at it. 10, 5 to 11, 5. So why do we want to soften the water? Why do we go to this trouble? So the scaling happens in the tank and not in the lines. All right. So when this lime comes in contact with water, it wants to sludge up. There's a reaction that happens that even though, you know, we already added water here, and it's kind of the same fucking water, but regardless, if you've got slaked water and it meets non-slaked water, it wants to react. And that reaction causes scaling, and that reaction causes sludge, and that reaction used to happen in this little connection pipe right before the gate valve. And that led to this and this hose being all fuckered up all the time. Fuckered up is a technical term. <laughs> so, by having this tank and putting slurry in there beforehand, then when the water, dilution water meets the slurry up here, the chemical reaction's already happened. So we don't have the problem anymore. 
uh, prior to having the softening tank, we tried softening directly in the FGD tank. But that was not far enough away, from, it was far enough away from this, but it had its own little fucking set of problems. So we needed a whole tank that would settle out, that we could take offline and clean while everything else was still running. I think that's it. What did I miss, Jackie? Bad. As far as the story, it's good. It's just, you know, vacuum breaker and stuff. Ah, and then you always miss that damn vacuum breaker. Like story. All right. Any questions?